Well, good, uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And first of all, <clears throat> can I thank the Academy for inviting me to uh, talk to you this morning? And if the slides could magically appear. So the topic that I would like to introduce to you is uh, uh, small satellites and bringing wider access to space. And in fact, it's a slight change of approach from the previous speakers because this uh, talk is going to be much more engineering focused. And as an engineer, I see engineering as making science useful. So uh, looking at uh, the evolution of small satellites and their applications, and then my colleague Will will follow my talk with some of the uh, applications. I would like to start by uh, explaining the background to small satellites. Now space, the use of space is expanding. It is an essential infrastructure for all national economies and their well-being and security, whether it be in communications, uh, providing timing and navigation, helping with agriculture, uh, or mitigating uh, disasters. Uh, and in 2018, everybody now has access to space. It's no longer the preserve of uh, superpowers or the most technically advanced and wealthy of nations. In the 1960s, there were perhaps two spacefaring nations. In the 1980s, half a dozen. But uh, post-2000, we have now more than 60 countries that have active uh, space programs. And the emergence of small but highly capable and low-cost uh, satellites has put sophisticated space assets within the reach of every nation. But what do we mean when we talk about small satellites? Well, small satellites have applications right the way across the spectrum that we've been discussing in the last uh, two days in Earth observation, in communications, navigation, and science. But uh, small satellites uh, uh, span a spectrum from very tiny satellites the size of a loaf of bread, perhaps weighing five kilos, to microsatellites, which have a mass about the same as myself, to mini satellites about the size of a small car. And each of these classes of spacecraft have different applications. And we will hear, I think, later this morning about the applications of some of the tiny satellites to space science. Um, the UK has been leading this field since uh, uh, the early 1980s. The first modern microsatellite uh, built at the University of Surrey was launched in 1981. And then the university decided that it was an opportunity to take research into the applications field and formed a small company in 1985. And this continues to work together as a really good example of the synergy of academic research and commercial exploitation. The key to, uh, to this uh, small satellite success is the exploitation of the uh, technologies and the consumer electronics that has gone into your smartphone, into your laptop, uh, into your uh, digital camera. Uh, the investments made into these technologies have been enormous, and we can use these uh, in order to provide highly capable but much more compact uh, spacecraft. And using the investment, the enormous investment that went into the development of these commercial and domestic technologies, we can do this at very low cost. So over the course of the last 35 years, we have launched something like 57 different satellites. At the university, we design, build, test, prepare them for launch, and operate them at orbit. And what I'd like to do is to give you an example of, of the applications and the uses of these small satellites. Now, we've had a, a very uh, strong ethos of bringing space to our international partners, partly because growing out of a university, we had that natural uh, uh, feeling of wishing to share our experience and expertise, particularly to developing nations and developing economies. And as part of that, we have indeed run a, a number of uh, something like 18 different international programs where we have invited teams from largely developing countries to come and spend one, two, sometimes three years working with us to develop their own spacecraft uh, to understand all the systems and technologies that need to go into it and then return back to their country to establish their own capabilities. And in many cases, out of these 18 programs, six of these the, uh, training programs form the nucleus of new space agencies in these newly developing uh, uh, countries uh, taking their first steps into space. 
Now, in the 1990s, the first application of small satellites was in digital storm forward communications, before the internet infrastructure existed, where it was uh, used the spacecraft essentially to act as flying mailmen, uploading electronic mail into the satellite, delivering it to remote regions, whether it be in the Antarctic for some science uh, teams to be able to get their data uh, retrieved back to civilization, or in Africa, where I had a very interesting experience uh, sitting with a, a group of midwives <clears throat> in, uh, in Kenya, uh, explaining to them how satellites worked, and in fact, they had a very good grasp of the basic astrodynamics uh, and were using the satellites in order to improve their knowledge of uh, midwifery. Now, the small satellites, uh, <clears throat> because of their low unit cost, means that you, it is now practicable and affordable to consider having constellations of these small satellites. Um, and when you have a constellation of the satellites, which orbiting something like five or 600 kilometers above the surface of the Earth, running like a, a string of pearls around the Earth as it turns underneath, it allows us then to image the Earth's surface uh, uh, every 24 hours. And in the year 2000, the first of these constellations was launched specifically to look at uh, disaster monitoring and in order to help recovery from uh, natural and man-made disasters. And this particular project was a very interesting one because it was like a mini UN in that we had six uh, different countries, each of which contributed a satellite into the constellation, but then operated them on a uh, cooperative and collective process. One a good example of the application of this power of small satellites in constellation was during the Indian Ocean tsunami in 2004. An enormous area around the Indian Ocean uh, was uh, devastated. It was very difficult to uh, uh, use high resolution uh, satellites to build up a thematic picture of such an enormous area. Uh, but by using the constellation for disaster monitoring satellites, very rapidly after the tsunami, the uh, uh, area was surveyed. This then allowed us to uh, zoom in and look at the various areas right the way around that coastal region and determine which bits had been devastated and uh, generate, generate maps which could be used by the UN and aid agencies to uh, prioritize their uh, disaster uh, relief services. Not only in the Indian Ocean, but another example in the Chinese Wenchuan earthquake uh, in 2008, this constellation was the first one to be able to provide images again back to the disaster relief teams. And in fact, there is a, generally about one major disaster per week uh, in the world. Uh, this uh, is then coordinated through the International Charter for Space and Major Disasters, into which this system and many other international systems contribute their space images in order to uh, aid uh, uh, relief. Now, <clears throat> whilst there are disasters once a week, of course there are many other uh, pressing issues, uh, and the satellites are used for monitoring uh, the, the evolution of ice in the Arctic and Antarctic, uh, illegal logging, and of course what is something very uh, pertinent just at the moment, forest fires. Um, also, looking at the Amazon, where in the Amazon, of course, it's very cloudy, so the satellites uh, passing uh, every day can build up over the course of a six-month period. They can build up a map of the deforestation uh, that's uh, taking place, and then this can be used for um, uh, regulation and uh, uh, control purposes. Now, of course, there are many, many applications for Earth observation, and I'm not going to list them here because uh, my colleague Will, who follows, will, will, will address some of those. Uh, but satellites can uh, assist in right the way across uh, you know, well over 100 different types of applications of uh, uh, in Earth observation. Now, sometimes it's necessary to have higher resolution, uh, and so this requires larger telescopes on the satellite, and now we're moving from a microsatellite, as I say, roughly the size of me, to a mini-satellite, uh, where if I stand next to that, I go about halfway up the, uh, the spacecraft. Here are three satellites which were launched three years ago. 
And these provide high resolution uh, imagery, which can be used for smart city planning. Uh, for example, there are applications which are monitoring not just traffic flow and, and building, and, uh, but also the uh, deposition of rubbish in, in many Asian uh, uh, countries. The resolution of these uh, satellites, of course, being bigger is somewhat uh, better. I'll give you an example here. You can count the engines on the uh, 747s. Um, and uh, what is particularly interesting is the development as well of microsatellites for real-time video from orbit. And here we can see an aeroplane taxiing down the, uh, the, the runway. Uh, but uh, in, in this particular instance, we're using this for city monitoring. You can see this is a video from the spacecraft because the clouds are moving across and you can see the... Uh, the cars running along on the uh, on the motorway, and this is uh, a video from about uh, 560 kilometres uh, in 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 orbit, using a spacecraft which is about the size of a domestic uh, fridge, and as costing uh, probably one tenth or one twentieth of what a spacecraft might have cost uh, a decade ago. Now, optical imaging is, uh, of course, uh, something we're very used to, um, but it's limited. You cannot image at night, and you cannot image through clouds. And most often, when we have uh, storms and disasters, there are clouds associated with it. So we have been developing uh, a... Uh, low-cost synthetic aperture radar spacecraft. Now, this is not new in terms of the concept, but these missions are generally extremely expensive in the hundreds of uh, millions of dollars. And the uh, challenge here was to build, uh, design and build a radar spacecraft at one-tenth of that cost, which can provide uh, useful information. Now, this uh, spacecraft carries not only a, an S-band radar, which is particularly good at looking at deforestation because you can actually penetrate the canopy and, and get a, uh, information on how many uh, tree trunks there are essentially that are being uh, logged, uh, but also maritime surveillance carrying with it automatic identification of shipping uh, sensors so that uh, this can be monitored and also uh, looking at flood extent monitoring. Now, the satellite was launched um, uh, two months ago, but uh, as a pair, one radar and one optical. So these two fly together, so the radar can do the initial survey of, of let's say, in the maritime sphere of where there may be ships, check whether the ships are transmitting the expected in, uh, information from their, their AIS, and then the optical satellite can be queued to follow it to have a closer look for those ships that we're not sure are doing exactly what we would like them to be doing. Now, over the, you know, this all started back in 1981 when small satellites were considered interesting but of no practical use. Uh, over the following decades, the use, uh, utility of these spacecraft has grown substantially. And in the last five years, there's what one might consider an explosion of interest in small satellites. And this has uh, resulted in a very large number of proposed systems. When I counted it up at the beginning of the year, there were well over 100 different constellations being proposed for a wide range of different applications. When you break these down, we saw that actually the vast majority of these, 90% of these constellations, were for uh, low Earth orbit communications, to provide, which promises to give high speed, low latency broad connect, broadband connectivity worldwide. And this has a potential to bring remote regions and remote communities into the global economy by providing them with access to the, the broadband techniques that we take for, for, for granted in the developing world. So 90% of these are focusing at the moment on communications, about 10% on Earth observation and a few others. However, if we add up all the satellites that are being proposed, we see it's something like 23,000 spacecraft in the next five years. That compares to something in the order of 600 spacecraft that are currently active. And what this means is that there's a real focus now on looking at the space environment, orbital debris, uh, which has uh, been growing ever since the uh, launch of the, spa of the space age. And this is now going to be a very significant issue. In fact, we have a, uh, a personal interest in this because in 1966, one of our satellites was hit by a piece of space debris, but it lived to tell the tale and we could work out what happened. Uh, but now we see with our current systems, we get alerts of debris coming within, let's say, 100 meters uh, on approximately once every fortnight and once every three months. We have to maneuver our satellites out of the way of space debris. 
So one of the challenges is how can we reduce this space debris? Well, first of all, uh, we need to stop satellites at the end of their life uh, just uh, sitting there and being the potential debris. And one way to, to do this is to include a little parachute, a sail that pops out at the end of the uh, operational lifetime of the satellite, and that can cause the spacecraft just to, uh, uh, essentially like a parachute in the residual atmosphere, to slow down and then eventually uh, burn up. And this is one way of self-cleaning the, uh, the space environment. But of course, the other problem is there's an awful lot of space junk out there already. It's not possible to uh, clean all of this up because there are millions of pieces of space junk that are bigger than the size of a, a golf ball. Uh, but there are a number of larger uh, uh, dead uh, rockets, uh, bodies, some defunct spacecraft, which themselves could represent a hazard of greatly increasing this debris field. So in order to, in order to be able to uh, uh, remove some of these potentially dangerous objects, we need to have active space debris removal. This means we need to go after the satellite, which is generally uncooperative, capture it, and bring it back down into orbit. And we carried out the first experiment in orbit a few months ago. Here is a target uh, of the, uh, the satellite. You saw the little spinning object is a piece of space debris that we deliberately took ourselves and then used, and it's very pertinent because we're sitting here in Rome near the Colosseum, we used a gladiator's uh, net, uh, which was fired from the mother spacecraft to go out and capture this piece of uh, space debris. And then a parachute is uh, uh, ejected, and, and then this brings the spacecraft back down into orbit and essentially cleans up that piece of space debris. Now, this is uh, the first uh, step in, in this uh, particular uh, exercise, uh, of course, to be able to start to clear up uh, much of the most critical bits of space debris is going to require significant investment, and it's not yet clear where that funding is going to come from. Is it the um, responsibility of the agencies that launch it, the companies that launch it, or the governments that uh, hosted it? Looking ahead, this is the first step in, in a growing uh, field of space robotics. The next step with a, a spacecraft that will be launched uh, uh, hopefully next year is to robotically assemble spacecraft in orbit, rather like you have the child's Lego game. We have uh, half a dozen small microsatellites which are launched. They then uh, uh, are separated and we can then click them together like Lego in different shapes to be able to uh, achieve different types of uh, reconfigurable apertures and eventually build up much larger apertures than we would be capable of launching in a single rocket nose cone. So this is the next step in space robotics, hopefully to be demonstrated in the next, uh, next year. And if we uh, look at where the trends are emerging, we've seen that you know, small satellites have exploited the advances in microelectronics. Um, however, uh, they haven't really developed much in terms of structural design. So the electronics has evolved dramatically, but not their structural designs. But new materials combined with robotics mean that we can now consider new spacecraft manufacturing techniques, uh, and uh, this can further reduce cost and increase uh, productivity. Um, and robotic additive and subtractive manufacturing means we can now make geometries which weren't previously physical, physically possible by, by human hands. And digital manufacturing now provides us with a freedom of location and dramatically increases the speed of the design evolution and the product innovation cycle. So currently we now see on the earth the digital factory. Um, we're seeing now a move towards software-defined spacecraft where the, the satellites can be morphed into different uh, applications in orbit. And the next step beyond that is uh, the uh, in-orbit assembly. And then further downstream, sometime in the next decade, will be in-orbit manufacture of spacecraft. Now, this has some implications. First of all, small satellites have brought space and its opportunities within the affordable grasp of pretty well every nation, any commercial business, and a university, and even some high schools. Um, the new space environment, which has created this enormous uh, thrust of investment in, in small satellite systems, is creating new approaches to space business and their applications to society. Like in the smartphone, 
who thought we needed all the apps we see on our smartphone 10 years ago? Uh, and yet now we, we, we find that they transform our lives. Um, small satellites are providing an opportunity to reduce the digital divide and bring underdeveloped communities into the global economy. And the uh, low cost, low unit cost of the satellites, this is going to be discussed in greater detail by my colleague Will following, means that persistent Earth observation and remote sensing means that we will be able to monitor the uh, behavior of our planet and its occupants with much greater fidelity <coughs> and timeliness. And it provides nations them individually to have a more direct view and better manage their own resources and the impact of human activity on their environment. And by knowing what's going on around you, hopefully we will also reduce international tension. And the whole development of robotics in space and software-defined satellites will fundamentally change the space, fundamentally change the space industry because very shortly we will not need all the complex infrastructure we have on the ground because ideally we will be able to launch in a rocket a lump of metal and a bag of sand, a 3D printer, and then upload the software in order to spin out our spacecraft in orbit. Bearing in mind that currently satellites are designed physically to survive the very rough ride in the first 20 minutes of their existence and thereafter they just float around in space, this is clearly going to be a dramatic change. Thank you very much.